Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, and welcome to the Hollywood Fishbowl. Yes, you heard that correct. The Hollywood Fishbowl is back after one entire year and a half of hiatus due to, I cannot remember the reason why we didn't do the show for a while. COVID. But that's what it was. COVID. Thank you. We've got producer Mark in the studio shouting at me already. <laughs> Lindsay, I think I can count on you to not shout at me. Excellent. Two thumbs up from the corner that I'm not going to get shouted at from there. Uh, but we, we, we are not alone. Nor should we be. We are absolutely not alone here on the Hollywood Fishbowl because if we were, it would be a really crappy interview show. <laughs> Instead of being alone, we have got with us the one, the only, the Chrissy Fox. Welcome to the program. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm, I'm good, thank you. Should we keep this button down and formal? Yes. Okay, yeah. then that's exactly what we will do. Thank you for your feedback early and often. Um, what we're going to do first, we have this little segment we call Five and Five. I'm going to hit you with five questions. You have one minute to answer each one, and we do have intense, awesome music to make it even more better. Is uh, that okay? Even more better, okay, yeah. Even more better than All it right. already is. Okay. Uh, so let's get into Five in Five. Question number one. Where did you grow up and how did that inform your adulthood? Wow, okay. I was born in Campbell River, British Columbia, Canada, which is on Vancouver Island. Um, I lived there until I was 15 and then I moved to Vancouver. Um, it made me really want to get out because I wanted to be an actress and it's a very small place, but it's very beautiful. Um, and I think just living in a small town made me want to I'm so I'm so stressful with the one minute thing that's exactly yeah. why we do it that way <laughs> wow um yeah it made me want to move on and you know get to a bigger city where I could live so my dreams did you go Vancouver to LA or were there any stops in between I went Vancouver to LA back to Vancouver back to LA back to Vancouver back to LA and now I'm just in LA Okay, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Are you are you happy to be back in LA or are you wishing I to get back to I love LA. I would love to know more, but your minute is uh, up. Oh. That was a minute. I felt like that was like five minutes. Wow. <laughs> that reflects very poorly on my interview <laughs> skills. I was like, oh, we're going way over. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Question two. Okay. What is the must engage media, the book, the album, the movie that opened up your mind to the very secrets of the universe? Wow. Okay. I don't know that there's a particular thing to open up the universe, but um, for horror, I have to say the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre opened up my horror universe. And as a girl with a lot of daddy issues, the film American Beauty kind of shifted my focus. I really, I, I connect with that film a lot. I love that. It's one of my favorite films ever. Quick question. At the mm -hmm. end of uh, Frank, you, you dedicate the film to your father. Is that... It's my grandfather. Oh, okay, yes. okay. My misreading. I no, apologize. No, my dad is awesome, though, actually, too. Okay. He's just... Okay. It's well, a long story. We don't have enough in a minute. <laughs> don't worry. We'll get into all your okay. daddy issues later. <laughs> and that's that's it. That's all the time we have for that question. Okay. Are you ready for question number three? Yes. Excellent. Here it comes. What is the greatest source of joy in your life? Wow. Well, obviously, I have to say my kids. Mm -hmm. um, my And if they weren't listening, who would you list as number one? <laughs> well, definitely them. But second would be making film. Um, writing and making films, it, especially during this COVID time, has been the thing that's kept me going and kept me positive and kept me happy and a decent human being to be around. So <laughs> I would definitely say that. Now, would you say that you are, in fact, a decent human being to be around? Depends on the day and okay. depends on, yeah, on the circumstance. But generally, yes. Generally, I'm a pretty happy person. Okay, okay. And are, are we going to, is it okay if we get into your writing process? I'd love to know, uh, not in this minute. Okay. But as, as the show progresses, I would love to know how you go from concept to finished product. We'll get yes, into that. of course. And that's all the time we have for question, I believe, three? Okay. Here's question four. The music just gets better every I know. time. What gets under your skin? Um, I can't stand people who just talk a lot about themselves. That's very exhausting. And people who are just like, you know, selling themselves all the time. I can't stand that. And I tune out. <laughs> Mark's pointing at himself. Mm -hmm. But Mark's really fun, so he, he's excluded from this category. Um, he's a good drinking buddy. But um, 
<laughs> that and I really hate spiders. I, so that's something that it's. I know it's more of a fear, but that anything to do with that, I have a hard time. When I saw arachnophobia, it fucked me up for a very long time. So fears, phobias, and things Mark does all qualify for right. what can get under your skin. They're all fair game. Well, for they're this. all just under the blanket of Mark. I think so. I'm wondering. Um, is it going to be a one-to-one -one ratio that all of our guests mention Mark as a drinking buddy at one point or another <laughs> yes. in, the, in the interviews? Yes. Okay. Okay. If they drink, yes. <laughs> we are down to the last question. Are you able to do it? I don't know. We'll find out. All right. Here we go. Number five. What is the let's talk about advice, not really a question, but what do you wish you know, knew when you were starting out your career? Um, it's something I follow very closely now, but... If you want to make something, just do it. Don't overthink it. Just, you know, write it, get a team together, film it, make it, because look what happens. Shit happens fast. If you just dive into it and quit questioning yourself or thinking you need, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars to make a film or just do it and quit, you know, being so in your head. Now, I have another pre-question question. question. Okay. Um, are we going to be able to talk budget on Frank on this, or do you, would you rather keep that kind of off I mean, the air? I mean, we can talk about it a bit, yeah. Okay, because uh, I'm, I'm very curious. I have my suspicions, uh, and I'd love, to, I'd love to be proven wrong. Okay. Um, and I would like to say a sincere congratulations. You have made it through. Yes. Five and five. We're going to slow things down now and, um, keep, you know, have like a normal conversation, mm -hmm. you know, the kind that two people might have right? Um, if they were <laughs> treating each other with respect and kindness. I don't know how to I, do that. I and I love to get started off on the wrong <laughs> foot with that five and five. Uh, let's go back to Vancouver. Okay. Or No, not Vancouver. The island near Vancouver. Yes. What was life like on the island? It's it's very small. Certainly it's, it's grown a lot recently. Um, but when I was growing up, you know, everybody works in the forestry industry or... They move to Alberta and they work in oil. It's hunting and fishing and basically all the things I don't like, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I, I don't want to be camping. And I don't. I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm like a nice hotel. I love animals. I don't want to hurt them. I, I just, I was always like really into entertainment, music, writing, and um, I was kind of an alien to a lot of my family and friends. They didn't get it, and I was like, "I'm gonna move, and I'm gonna be an actress, and I'm gonna and and um, and so when I was 15, I had started to really get to know my dad, and he lived in Vancouver, and he actually worked on the X Files. He did, okay. did sets on the X Files, so I was always told, "Well, you can't do that job. You have to know somebody." I'm like, "Okay, I know somebody. Obviously, totally different department. Actually, no help in, but in my mind, I was like." That was the thing All I needed. All you need is one. All yeah, you need is one. exactly. So off I went. Now, you said you were getting to know your dad. Did you not know him so well? Can any? Yeah. First of all, can any of us truly know our fathers? No. Okay. And my dad is really rad. But yeah, he was, I didn't know him really till I was 13. Um, and okay. then he just, yeah, he became a big figure. Was he like one figure. of those opt out fathers? And then you <laughs> roped him back in? So I think so. And he, but he just, um, yeah, and like my parents were really young when, and I, they were never like I think they. That's broke like up. endemic of our generation. Yeah. That's. Yeah, and like I think they broke up when my mom was still pregnant, so that was a whole thing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I got reconnected. I started getting curious, asking a lot of questions. My mom reconnected us, and um, I realized a lot of my personality traits or interests probably stemmed from him being my father and you know because a lot of it didn't make a lot of sense with the yep. other influences i had so so you grew up hearing this voice of his in the back of your head not knowing <laughs> whose voice it was right then you feel that you, you finally meet him and you're kind of getting your feet on the ground with with where you want to be later in life right that kind of thing well i just told you know he was the first person i told what i wanted to do and what i was interested in and it made complete sense to him mm -hmm. you know and like i said it wasn't his department he was never into like acting he didn't he's not like a writer or a director or anything like that but he um he worked in film he was someone like me who kind of dreamed big and he didn't even go to school for it and he worked his way up and he he works in a high level position right now on a, a tv series that's really successful and so he um when i told him i wanted to be an actress he's like well let's go get you an agent and we did. And oh, excellent. Yeah, and it it started, you know, to grow from there. And 
when does the music hit? Is that is that high school time or is that um, um, later in life that you kind of? I always wrote music. Okay. Uh, I my first focus was acting at the beginning. And I, first of all, thank you for calling it your first focus and not your first love. It's yeah. such a less pretentious way to describe these things. <laughs> first love. You know, that's a whole other thing. No, um, no music oh, came in. Oh, don't worry. In. We'll get into your first love later. <laughs> we don't have enough time for that. Um, no, uh, I think the the first major, I always wrote music. Um, I ended up dating a musician who was signed. Um, we ended up getting married later. And um, still married? No, we're not. Okay. But we're very close, and I still work on other albums. And so we started writing for his band, and then I started writing for other bands, and we ended up having a single that went to number one, and it was a really huge hit. It kind of put their band on the map. And I was like, oh, okay. And all of a sudden, my phone started ringing, and people wanted me to write for them. And so I um, I sh shifted from acting for a minute, and I put more focus into music for a while, and I felt like. Writing for bands was awesome, but I also needed an outlet for myself. So I started my own band, mm -hmm. and we toured a lot. And it was really cool because there was kind of, you know, just like writing your own script. There's no limits if you're writing for yourself. You can, you know, say whatever you want to say, and you, your music can be as weird as you want or, you know, influenced by as many things as you want. So that was that was great. And um, But I started having that ache for acting and writing, and, and I just really wanted to make – Film and I and I, I missed that. So, quick question, that. just an honest yeah. question: Have you ever seen a red light in your life? No. Okay. <laughs> just had to ask. It sounded like you didn't. No. This is it's the other. There's the green light, which is yeah. I think what you're familiar with, but the opposite of that. Uh, I'm sure I've been I've been shown them. I just I just oh, okay, I'm okay, not okay. I'm not very uh, I I just you can't tell me something if I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. How old are you when you get to L.A. though? The first time. I was 20, 20 or 21. Okay. And um, Are you coming here with big dreams that get dashed and that's why you go back? Or is it just kind of like, I can't, is it the thing where you showed up with way less money than you actually needed <laughs> to jump into LA life? No, it was actually really, um, I came down here and I kept booking acting roles in Vancouver. So I kept having to go back. Oh, okay. Oh, it was, it was a... <laughs> So I just kept going a back problem and forth, of surplus, back and forth. Not, yeah. not a famine. Okay. Yeah, it was. And then, you know, I eventually was like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to write. And I was writing a lot down here. So that was great. And um, okay, and you're talking features now, not. No, I was talking music. Okay. And okay. then, and then um, yeah, it just grew. LA is pretty crazy because it, it's the exact stereotype if you choose to see it that way. Like there's endless opportunity. Yes. You know? Everything awful you've heard about LA is true, yes. but also all the good stuff that you don't hear about is true too here. Exactly. Yeah. No, I feel like LA, you know, you can, there are those people that you're warned about. There are, there, there's all, all of that exists, but if you choose to avoid it and focus on all the good things, LA has more opportunity than anywhere I've ever been. Um, and, you know, you throw a rock and you find an amazing actor to act in your film, uh, an amazing cinematographer. Like my team that I've found here is amazing. And and I just feel like there's just so much talent here just waiting to be found. And I, I have like the best community and family of people around me. and. I've never felt like that the way I do when I live in LA. So, right there with you. Yeah, absolutely, right there with you on this one. Do you want to get into Frank? It sounds like we're steering into Frank territory. Sure. All right, let's talk Frank. Um, so I made I made a huge grievous error. Okay. And that was that I agreed to do this interview before watching your film. Oh no. So, okay. First thing I want to do is thank you for making a not terrible film. In fact. I would describe it as a very good film. Well, thank you, but you haven't seen it, right? No, I have seen it. Oh, you I watched have it last night. Oh, we booked thank this, God. Oh, and then okay, I watched. I no, no, no! I'm not coming into this interview oh, okay. blind for okay, heaven's okay. sake. <laughs> and I've got, actually got a lot of questions about Frank okay, that I'd okay. love to drill down into. Um, but before we get into that, uh, let's talk a little bit about your short film work. Frank is not your first film project. Is it your first no. feature? It's my first feature. Okay, yes. okay. Let's talk about the projects that led up to that and how those came to fruition. What what predated Frank? Well, originally, um, music videos, directing and making my own music videos. Uh, me and my partner, Spider One, started this production company called One Fox Productions. And um, 
we just decided to just, you know, quit talking about it, like I said, and just go for it and like, let's make some shit. Let's see what happens. So my first short was called What the Spell. And um, a, a bold title. I'm always curious <laughs> when people make the title of their film a pun. I'm yeah. always. <laughs> I, I, you know, I went back and forth, but, you know, I, I'm I'm a decisive person. I'm so like, you, did have, you did have other non pun titles for that film. <laughs> I had a lot of ideas, but okay. I, I just felt like what the spell was correct. It's a horror comedy. Mm -hmm. And um, definitely sets the tone that yeah. title does. And it's it's ridiculous. But it, the heart of it is this friendship between these two girls and. And they um, basically the character I play, Ryan, she gets cheated on or so she thinks by her, her boyfriend. Um, she gets a DM from a girl who goes to their gym saying they slept together. She's devastated. She calls her best friend over. They get really drunk and they just have one of those weird girl moments where they're like, let's pull out a spell book from when we we're in high school and we we're obsessed with the craft. Let's put a spell on them and they're drunk and, you know, nothing's really making a lot of sense. They invite Adam over. And they put the spell in him and he dies. And so now these girls have murdered someone and they have to figure out what to do. So they end up putting a bring the dead to life spell on him and he comes back as a demon and is trying to kill them. So uh, whoops, I murdered you is a common theme in your films. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think it's a funny idea. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is very compelling. <laughs> Which leads to my next question. Have you ever, whoops, I killed someone? No. Okay. No. Um, Follow up, and, and this is uh, journalistic integrity. If you had, would you say yes on a podcast or would you lie about it? It depends if I'd been caught. Okay. If I like did my time and I'm out, sure. Okay. Yeah. Short version, this is all sounding mighty suspicious. I know, understandably. <laughs> okay, so you, you complete what the spell. Does that do a festival run and it did. garner it some did accolades? A, it did the whole festival run of 2020, which was the weird, crazy COVID <laughs> time, but it did super well at a bunch of festivals, and it kind of just, you know, it was testing the waters, and it showed me, oh, maybe I should keep, you mm -hmm. know, doing this, and, and Spider felt the same, and he's been making his, and so we kept going, and then I had this idea of, um, I originally didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I had this idea of doing something possibly anthology-ish that I wanted to make a monster movie. And, and this is not Frank that you're this talking is about. This Frank. Okay, because Frank felt like, I couldn't think of a word for it other than nonthology. Yeah, it's, it it's is, not, but it, yeah. <laughs> Um, let's, if we're going to jump into Frank, what I'd like you to do as a favor to our audience is just yeah. kind of set it up, do the elevator pitch so they know what we're talking about. Okay. And I will warn the audience that we are not holding back on spoilers. We're going to talk about this film openly okay. and honestly because okay. I, w I really want to get into it. I've got so many questions and I'm hoping to God you have a few answers. <laughs> Hopefully. Me too. So what what is Frank? So Frank, basically the, the story goes that a girl named Ruby, who I actually play in the film, she has this awful abusive boyfriend and um, he's like a drug addict and his friends are losers. And one night he comes home and he starts beating her up and she thinks he's going to kill her for real. So she's praying and she's not a religious person and she's locked in a bedroom and him and his friend are like going to break down the door and cut her up basically. His friend was really game for this mayhem. He jumped oh, yeah. right into he's it. He's down for whatever. <laughs> yeah, they're, these guys are losers. So... So Ruby's praying and she doesn't know who she's praying to. And the person who, or the thing that answers her prayers is this demon from the underworld named Frank. Um, and he basically makes her like vow servitude to him for his life and that he would save her from the scenario. So Ruby has no choice. She agrees. She can't handle it because she's involved in the death of her boyfriend. Her and Frank kill them, obviously. And um, and so she can't deal with it, so she commits suicide, which breaks this deal. And so Frank is really pissed off at this point, so he decides to go through, and anyone vulnerable in her life that's connected to her, he just goes on this bloody rampage, killing everybody, all in search of, he, at the end, he's looking for her sister, the person that she loves the most, to just really punish Ruby. And, you know, other things happen, obviously. I don't want to give away the ending just yet, but yeah, that, yeah. That's we'll, the basic we'll stick line. away from the third act a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but I do want to get into, I don't even know if you break this down into acts because it, it is such a nonthology film. It's yeah. all tied together in one sort of narrative, weaving it all together. Uh, my first question about that nonthology approach is um, was that like a, a budgetary concern? Was that a thing 
that you knew you could get these people for this week or this location. So you kind of segmented the film. Were you reverse engineering from that anthology idea or was it an anthology to begin with? And then you wove them together. How did that, how did that process go? Well, it really came from, I loved the process of making a short film because I feel like a short film is a special thing if you do it right. And I've seen a gazillion of them now after doing the festival circuit and seeing, you know, the people who do it right, the people who do it wrong. And I thought it was really challenging because you have to do this storyline that's really compact, that has a twist, that has a punch, and it has, it has to go somewhere in a very small amount of time. So when COVID happened, I just like everybody, when I realized, oh, this isn't going away, I started getting super bombed. I'm like, well, what are we going to, like, what am I going to do here? You know, and I had this idea for this film and I was like, well, what if I form it as though they're shorts, but it's all one big movie and it's all one monster tormenting everybody. Everybody's connected. It's not really an anthology, but it also gave me room because with COVID, I didn't know how far we would get. We truly like, our company and myself, we did this on our own. So I was like, maybe yes, we'll only the, get two, you the, know? The credit list betrays that we did it on our own. Yeah. The whole film, I did not get a sense of how small the cast and crew was yeah. and how much of the cast was also doing, uh, what was it, casting, directing and stuff like that. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was something that I was like, okay, we're gonna shoot this first one. I was in the first segment you know, it mm -hmm. shows you the suicide. It. You took the, yeah. the Michael Caine approach to, to right. casting yourself. Right. And you know what's funny is the reason I actually did that role is because th that opening story is so physically challenging. I didn't mm -hmm. want to put another actress through it. So I was like, okay, I'm going to play this character because I'm going to get the shit beaten out of me. Yeah, it was in a pretty big ask for somebody yeah. who's not... Not as deeply involved as you are in the exactly. production. Exactly. So that was the idea between that. So we got that one done, which, you know, was the, you know, the first way to like kind of test the water. And then I actually ended up shooting the second and third back to back. And mm -hmm. I shot the second one in one day and then the third one in one day. So we the did second one is mostly in the bedroom, the stoner husband. And the third one is the, the uh, Richie bitch. Yeah. Friend. My stepmother. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's fill in the, let's fill in the blank spots of the map yes. right now. <laughs> yeah. So do you mean your stepmother or Ruby's stepmother? Ruby's stepmother, oh, not my real stepmother. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. thought, I thought you were about to, yeah. to blow up someone's spot on this no, show. No, no, no. <laughs> That's Lindsay. She, I wish she was my stepmother. That would be a lot of fun, but yeah, she, <laughs> Um, what was the other question that I had? Um, the, the, the casting. Can I talk to you about casting yeah. for a minute? Um, M Mary Lane. Uh -huh. What the fuck? Yes. What the fuck was that? That was <laughs> such a good performance. Yeah. Who was, did you write Mary Lane for, was it Azure? Is that Azure, her? yeah. Azure, sorry, sorry. Did you write the, the um, part for her? Was that like reverse engineered from the person you knew or did it's you write that It's actually a crazy story. So... Uh, originally, I Azure was Azure and I both were in what the spell. We were the two best friends. Oh, okay, and, okay, okay. And her and I are actually good friends in real life. So you knew what you were getting with her yeah. when you put her on screen. You were able to write yeah. kind of for but the talent. But originally, oh, oh, okay. It, so originally, she was going to be in the second story. She was going to be the wife, um, uh, Lydia. Okay. Um, and then Azure had a medical thing she had to deal with, so she couldn't do it. So I actually asked Lindsay, who was. Um, in the third story if she had anyone really great and she sent a few of her friends or actresses auditions in and I picked Rachel mm -hmm. um, and, and then playing Richie Bitch or a Richie Bitch yeah sorry sorry uh, <laughs> so Richie Bitch which which is Charlotte in the film thank you uh, yes. most of the segments you were very diligent about setting up the names very clearly at the yes. top of the segment I did not catch hers and <laughs> I just started calling her Richie Bitch in my mind and that's who fair. she is now yeah no I mean that is her character basically so so um, I cast Lindsay first as Charlotte. Um, and so when I was doing the second segment, I was like, I need a really strong actress. She has to carry basically the entire, her entire section of the film from one location. She has to be really powerful. She gave me a couple options. And when Rachel read, I was, she was obvious to me that she was the right character. They play sisters. Mm -hmm. So they have a, you know, their dynamic was great. Um, so that was fine. And then originally the girl who was in Charlotte's story, the third story, Lace, the girl who plays Lacey, was actually going to go in and be the fourth story. Um, and so 
she had an issue with some of the edginess of the fourth story. There's the sex scene. There's a lot of, and she was like, I'm not really comfortable, but I didn't want to remove that from the film. So I ended up rewriting the story and I made Azure do it. I was like, Azure, okay, you're better now. Like, y you have to do this. Um, it, it's just you. And and she was amazing. I mean, she she did. I knew she would, but she was the absolute right choice and she, it needed to be her. So I was very happy that everything happened how it happened and, you know. Also, um, if we can talk a little bit more about that, that is it okay if I call it the Mary Lane story? Yeah. Okay, the Mary Lane story. So I'm I'm watching the whole film. You watch the first, the the suicide, then you watch segment one, segment two, and you feel like you're getting an idea of the rules and the pattern and what mm -hmm. Frank is and how he interacts with people. Uh, the Mary Lane story is kind of like you you open up the the origami box; it just keeps unfolding and yeah. unfolding. Um, and it made me wonder is. Is that Mary Lane story, was that like another story you had in your back pocket and you kind of reworked it for this film? Like what what was that? Because because it felt like the film went from, a, you know, a television show to a feature film, like it, <laughs> the, uh, a cinematic universe. It yeah. felt like like the, the edges of the map just spread out a thousand miles in every direction. What what was that? Where did that come from? And and where is it headed? <laughs> Well, originally, yeah, that was a, fil a feature I wrote. Um, and I changed the story for this because I was gonna I was gonna physically make that story a feature and there was obviously gonna be a lot more to it. Um, but when I started really putting Frank together and I edit as I go, I, I do all the posts myself. So when I looked at the first three stories, I was like, you know, I already knew I was going to incorporate that story. I didn't know how much of the film idea I had I was going to really use. And I was like, I'm just going it, to, it needs to be there. I feel like it's such a crazy, yeah, it could be a film on its own. So, um, yeah, I just ended up diving into it and putting, that's why it's the longest segment because it was already, you know. Is that based on anything in in your heart or in your life? That was, It was such a weird premise that... Maybe you can explain it. Maybe I can explain it. Do you, if you want to break from talking, I can try to give them a clue in the in listening land of what they were seeing. I mean, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, please, please, yeah, just set it up because it, it felt it was it was a divergent path for this story. So Mary Lane is the cousin of Ruby, and she's this really lonely kind of lost soul. She has a good job. She has a, a nice house. Not as lonely and lost as her neighbor is, though. Oh, her neighbor, yeah. We'll get into her, too. Okay. Yeah, she's she, that was another crazy thing to do with that story. Well, let's let's stay yeah. focused. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm the one distracting you and then telling you to stay focused. I apologize. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so she's this lost soul. She has, Yeah, she has a good job. She has a nice house. She really should have it figured out. She's in her mid-30s, but she hasn't, and she's... She, all she wants, she has, she's like this dreamer and she just wants like the fairy tale romance. She wants to be in love and it's just not happening for her. And a lot of it is due to her being really desperate for it. And, you know, I think a lot of people in their life, you'll get to a place where you're like, oh, I, I got to be in a relationship. I'm afraid to die alone. I'm afraid. And you're just like oozing this desperation out of you that honestly like deters <laughs> that. And the second no, what you, are you like, talking about? Nothing is sexier than desperation. <laughs> I know. Well, some people love it. But, <laughs> but then the second you relax and you stop looking for it, it comes. And so it wasn't happening for Mary. She was blind to the fact that she was taking this dance class and, and our movement class. And there's a guy who is adorable in her class that clearly is eyeing her all the time, but she's so clueless about herself and so uncomfortable that she, she doesn't even see it. And so she has this bizarre neighbor who comes over and they have this like deep, weird conversation. And Mary explains that her, well, her uncle who married Charlotte from the third story Charlotte has this guru that basically he helps you manifest your dream man. And he's been tell she's been telling her and pushing in on Mary. And Mary's like, no, it's nothing's working. I'm just going to call this guy. I'm going to call him and I'm going to see if it works. So she calls him. He comes over. He basically teaches her that you need to manifest your dream man as though he's real. You need to talk to him. You need to have sex with him. He's invisible. You need to have dinners with him, dates. You need to get to know him. You need to like you know, know what makes him jealous and angry. And you have to commit to this. And if you commit to this, your desperation will go away and it'll open you up to finding a real man and real love. And Mary thinks about it. And she's like, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense. 
So she does it. She dives into this, but she manifests him so well that he becomes real. And no one else can see him, but Mary can see him. And he's very jealous and very dangerous. And this is where the film uh, went from being entertainment to really kind of like getting its hooks in my heart is that um, is she she manifested from the, the bedrock of her imagination, she manifested an asshole. Yeah. Which says so much. <laughs> yeah. What, like, is that in you? Is that what you see in the world? I know, I don't mean that, like, is that yeah. the only thing in the world or the yeah. only thing in you? But where, where does that, where did that come from? It really made me uncomfortable and, and unhappy. Um, <laughs> well, good. I'm glad I'm doing my job. <laughs> no, you did it perfectly. You totally, you, you, you had me, um, you had me, you had me, you had my attention through the film. Thank you. When I saw his, when I saw the reflection in the mirror, that was when I was thinking like, oh, okay, I have no idea what's going on. She's got more tricks up her sleeve. Yeah. Um, and then as that progressed, as he became, as this this imaginary boyfriend became an asshole, um, I realized you have like a whole, there's a whole other universe. Right. Um, what the fuck? That's the question. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily <laughs> and if you can, think. if you could make an answer yeah. out of the question, yeah. what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? Well, the thing is, is I don't really think, I mean, he does sort of, I guess, become an asshole, but. All Mary wanted was to be desired and wanted. And so she manifested this jealous He sort of person. becomes an asshole. Yeah. He's choking her to death. Yeah. Well, because she decided to go on a date with this guy from her movement class mm -hmm. in real life. I just and, can't believe you're defending this well, imaginary guy. You know, that, but it's, Mary manifested him. So it was, that's what she wanted. Or mm -hmm. what she thought she wanted, but she was wrong. She actually ended up, on the other hand, getting a real decent, adorable guy who liked her. But then you have to start to wonder, is everything in Mary's head? Is the guy even real? Mm -hmm. Is she just totally losing it, you know? And and that's like, there's a couple interesting moments that like when you hear Jeffrey, the invisible boyfriend, crashing and throwing things around in her house. Mm -hmm. Like, why doesn't the other guy hear it? You know what I mean? You notice how she's reacting, he's trying to kiss her. And he doesn't hear all this commotion going on in oh, the house. Oh, I just read that as he was kind of clueless. Yeah, that, but that. and maybe maybe that it was it. But no, then but maybe that, he my, also. Am I thinking he could hear the crashes? But he was like, I'm still going to try to get my little yeah. smooch tonight. That's how. <laughs> well, and you may be right, but I guess I, I, I want to leave as, it open for people. You that, certainly may. I'm yeah. not trying to close any doors. Yeah. So I tried to do that a lot, and then obviously I don't know how much we want to give away with that story, but. Obviously, Frank has to come into play, and he does. Mm -hmm. But he comes into play in, in this a, story in a very different way. In, yes, he does. Um, and then you have to wonder, did she manifest Jeffrey or did she manifest Frank? A uh, quest behind the scenes question. Yes. In that very different way that he manifested. Did that exist from the torso down or was it strictly torso up, that other iteration of Frank? Like, what do you like? The, the gooey spike one? Oh, like the melty? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it was the whole body, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was crazy. And it, he was physically melting while we were like, we got to shoot this quick. He's melting. His eyeball's coming out. It was crazy, yeah. Um, and here's the other thing that Mary Lane opened up in that movie for me. Um, the, you, it, you did something that's very frustrating narratively and cinematically. And that was you were punishing... I felt needlessly a lot of people that I liked and cared for and wanted to see succeed. Yeah. Um, this is not rewarding cinematically, but uh, this is a very honest depiction of how suicide affects mm -hmm. the the living. Yeah. Um, and I w it, it made me start to wonder if you like what what your relationship with suicide was. If any, yeah. is it is it fantastical? Is it way too intimate to want to talk about? Like, wh where are you on that spectrum, if I may? I think that a lot of people, obviously, either whether they actually do it, they struggle with it themselves and the desire. I, I had a lot of, growing up in a small town, a lot of kids I went to school with killed themselves, which, like, more than most people I know. It was, it was just a really sad, you know, kid that you, like, there was a boy that I had a crush on that he hung himself when we were in like tenth grade, and it was awful. And um, and hanging is such a a hard way to go. That that betrays so much pain yeah. and and commitment to to the decision. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing about suicide. It's like 
you went through with it. Like that's how much you didn't want to be here. I, I find it to be one of the most devastating concepts. And, you know, obviously it's risk, risque sort of to put, you know, show someone hanging themselves in a film and, and it's not like it hasn't been done before, but it's like, you know, if you're going to go there, you have to go there. But I feel like I needed to show how Mary truly felt, or I'm sorry, Ruby truly felt like she could, couldn't see any other way out of this and how dark and twisted the, the hold Frank had on her was and how she just, she was an actual decent person who dated a horrible, horrible guy who, you know. Who had horrible, horrible, but very game friends. Yes, horrible, horrible people. And, you know, it, it kind of opens up when you, on the in the last story, when you see Ruby side of it and her physically being attacked, you... It, 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 it talks about her and, she, you know, she's sitting reading a book. She's not fucked up on drugs. She's not out partying, but he is. And it's like, you know, I, I, I've personally known a lot of people. Why are you in that relationship with that person? They're so different from you. They're so bad for you. But they love them and they because there's a piece of them. There's something like, you know, they're getting from that scenario. And sometimes it's a bad thing. And so I really wanted to show how Ruby felt like she had no way out to go to Frank. And then with Frank, she's really trapped in her best option was to kill herself and I don't think she ever realized that by doing that how many people's lives she was going to endanger you know yes yeah yeah the ripples from suicide uh hit hard when when they do um yeah and I guess that was kind of the idea is like obviously not everyone gets a monster but certainly if you you know if you know someone or if you commit suicide you have to think about all the people's lives it's going to affect and what it's going to do to each person and I did want to you know have that overlying feeling because yeah I've personally experienced it and I have a lot of friends and family members who have experienced it and you know it's it's awful it's yes. sad on both ends yes yes yeah. yes and the 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 coldest comfort that I've ever been able to get to with it, with any of it, is like just this. In, I, I just keep telling myself like I have to trust the person who did it that they understood what they were doing. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't, you know, that's like a band aid on a bullet wound. It just it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Um, let's let's get back to Frank. Okay. <laughs> fun though this. <laughs> yeah, is. as fun as this was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so God, there's whiskey in front of me. There's uh there's a lot of there's a lot of good character moments, a lot of good um horror moments in in Frank. Are there any moments that you feel particularly proud of in the film? Oh god, let me think. I have to go through. Um I really love the first reveal of Frank when Ruby is hiding behind the tree and then he's just standing there. I just I I, I love that attack scene and it's really bizarre because it's almost like he's like trying to meet with her or something. It's like he's not like necessarily just tearing her apart. He's like feeling her and doing this. And I think that that was a really fun, weird thing to shoot. It was the first thing we did. And and so that was cool. I really liked, um, I liked a lot of the third story with Lindsay who plays Charlotte and um, the idea of Frank that, on the roof. <laughs> the the roof was good. I liked uh, when they were in bed together. That was, that was so delightfully funny. intimate. It was so weird. And um, I also really, we spent a lot of time, because all of the effects in this film are practical, um, building these ribs that he could rip open and, you know, engulf her inside of him, <laughs> whatever you'd say. In, yeah. Can I, can I influence you to talk about... Um, the, the costume design, the Frank design, yeah. was that like how, how involved were you in that? Were you up late at night sewing with the team or how, no, did, how did that so, come to be? Well, uh, it came from a drawing. I designed him. Um, I did a basic idea. I had Spider help me with he's a much better artist than me, but I knew exactly how I wanted Frank to look. I wanted him to have like this thicker neck. He only has one eye. There's like just some like weirdness about him, the, the fingers. And I, w I knew I wanted him to be white because we we're going to shoot a lot in the dark and I really wanted him to pop no matter what. Um, so yeah, so I came up with this design and then I reached out to my makeup team, which was Gitsy and Tyler. And Tyler 3D printed the ribs, the fingers, all the stuff. He, he like created those and made them be able to bend and move and and they would physically every time make Frank with like they would bald cap painting latex it just took hours to make him every day but it was it wasn't a suit or anything it was all like physically made on 
on the actor. So, how many days did you shoot with Frank in full costume? Um, we shot. Let me see. One, two. So there's two Franks actually in the film. So I don't know if you noticed there's a, two Franks. Two Franks. So I wanted him as he killed people to physically get larger. Yes, yes, yes. I was wondering if that was happening or not. Yeah. Uh, thank you for for clearing that one up. Yes. Yeah, so the the first so the first Frank he shot two days, and then the second Frank shot two days. I believe two. Yeah, two days. So um, you got a lot of mileage out of those four days. Yes. Well, and it was with with that type of makeup and that kind of undertaking, we we knew we had to do as much as we could. So actually the second and third story, both of the Frank things we shot on the second day. So I had Lindsay come in just to do the end kill and the roof scene um, the day before, like that night. And, um, and we shot that so we didn't have to get Frank. Also like Frank is fully covered and so he can't go to the bathroom mm -hmm. so and it's something you don't think about but if he had to go to the bathroom for instance they'd have to cut a hole in his thing and and then we had to put it all back together so it was it was a lot to do so we tried to like okay yeah. i remember when we shot the bedroom scene where he was standing at the end of her bed um in the second story he had to pee so bad. I was like, God, do this as fast as we can. We gotta go, he's gonna pee. And so, um, yeah, there was a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was a big undertaking. It, um, the original Frank was actually gonna be a friend of mine. I was like, okay, we're gonna do the makeup test today. It was two days before we shoot. And he put it on and he freaked out. He's like, I can't do it. I'm so sorry. I can't do it. I'm too claustrophobic. And I'm like, I don't have a monster and we're shooting in two days. So, um, I called a bunch of people and I found this dude who's a friend of a friend who's in this band where they all wear masks. And so I knew he would be comfortable. He's not an actor. And I was like, oh my God, let's just pray. And uh, and he came in and the one thing that we didn't account for is he, he drank the night before and I guess the, the makeup and the latex it, the he adhesive doesn't stick if you've been drinking and there's like your, there's alcohol in your pores <laughs> so it wouldn't stick to him so we had how to do, much does this guy drink that <laughs> i don't know i didn't even know him at the time probably a lot i would think but he didn't know it wasn't his fault yeah, like, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and i didn't even i didn't know never would have come up yeah and so we're like oh my god so we we did make it work it happened but the, after that we're like you cannot drink and like the frank diet had to be very particular <laughs> and uh and then the second frank was actually a a movement actor and he he was he took classes for it and so he um he was really excited to do that it was his first real monster movie and um did we did see any of the franks out of makeup anywhere in the film did they make a, a themselves no. cameo ah the best the best ever i have to at some point post behind the scenes trying to in the first story watch Frank try to run in the forest because <laughs> he can't see, he's barefoot, it's like pitch black and he's in all this. And so it was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. And you're trying to be like encouraging, but everyone was like peeing their pants, like watching <laughs> this. Um, what were, were the, While you were making this, mm -hmm. it's low budget, um, no secrets there. Were there any were there any compromises that absolutely broke your heart? Was there anything that didn't make it into the film that just not killed you, but half killed you? There's a couple things that we definitely, you know, we couldn't, it was, a lot of it was t time. Like, yeah, I wish yeah, we had yeah, more time. Always, what was it, like 15 days, 10 days shooting? How much did you have total? Dude, we shot, let me see, the first one was a one, two, three, six days. We shot the whole film. That's very efficient. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. It was crazy. And we had, mul like, you know, not to give away, but we did have multiple monsters. And as you mentioned, there's a scene where Frank is a melting Frank, which is a totally different design mm -hmm. on the same day as regular Frank. And it was, yeah, it was crazy. And I, I it was very, like, optimistic like we can do this and i have no idea if we can do this but we did oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah dude that's that's always the thing with yeah. filmmaking it is all complete lies and bullshit until yeah. the second it's all done and then you're like oh yeah i guess we could have done it <laughs> like we did it yeah no it was it was crazy and um you know the last story was a lot too like you know um bonnie aarons stars in the last story and she also narrates the film who she's the nun i um, wanted to rip pp off the screen and throw him into a lava pool 
Yeah, he's he's so good. I, I've used him now in multiple films because of course, I, Raddick, of course. his name is, and he's a fantastic actor. And he's just, it's funny because I found, I was looking for the girl to play my sister. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anyone who, and I, because of the type of film it was, I was trying to go off recommendations, off people I know, because it's it's a lot. It's a lot to do in one day. And and, um, you know, you just don't know how easygoing certain people are, how willing, you know. And But I saw this girl on Instagram, and this random photographer took photos of her headshot. And I just, I took a chance, and I DM'd her. I was like, hey, because she looked like me, and mm -hmm. and she was adorable. And so I DM'd her. She was really excited. Uh, I was like, can you send a tape? Um, I'm going to send you some sides. And she did, and the, I didn't see, obviously, but the reader ended up being her roommate, who was Radic, who played Pee-Pee. And I heard him, and I didn't even physically see what he looked like, and I knew I had to have him as well. And I was just like, so I just was like, hey, do you know? Did the role of Pee-Pee <laughs> exist before you heard? Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah Pee-Pee. And was he that Pee-Pee'd out, or did yes. you in he, pee -pee him? He was exactly okay. what I wrote, and he read it exactly and i was just like that's him and i was like please don't be like 45 years old or something oh, and dude i just wanted to punch <laughs> him in the face every sentence he said was so delightfully punchable yeah i know <laughs> um let's let's talk a little bit about if we may if we may whoa whoa whoa, whoa. let's not talk about that yeah. uh we need to talk about the the narrator yes who is she and so how did you find her so bonnie aarons who plays the nun narrates the film um, the reason she narrates the film is in the final story, she is a medium mm -hmm. who basically helps Karen, um, the, Ruby's little sister, communicate with her sister and connect to her. And so obviously she is able to see a lot of the realities of what actually happened to each person. And she has all this insight that everybody else wouldn't have. And so she kind of tied the film together. I met Bonnie because really randomly after I shot the Mary Lane segment with Azure, um, I was starting to cast and get ready for this segment. And I had a few weeks and um, I found the kids and Azure randomly out of nowhere texted me. And she's like, hey, if you ever like have a role that would make sense, like you should you should meet my friend Bonnie. She, she'd be great. She said she really wants to work with you. And she sent me Bonnie's Instagram. And of course, I, I knew who Bonnie was. If you know horror, you know who Bonnie is. And I was like, Oh my God, I have to literally cast Mr. Seed and she is perfect. I think. I didn't know her. So I call her on the phone and she was like really excited. And if you get to know Bonnie, she is like, fuck this, fuck that, all that fucking fuck that. And she's just so bigger than life and vulgar and crazy. And I was just like, you're her. I'm like, listen, I just want you to be yourself. Be yourself. I don't want you to do anything else. And she came in and just like nailed this character. And she was, she's so intense and scary compared to the kids. It was so great. I loved it. I loved it. And that scene did bring like a whole new energy to the, to the film and really kind of just ratcheted everything up <laughs> in, in delightful ways. Um, can we go back to music? No. Okay. Yes, of I course. didn't want to anyway. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, am I correct in thinking that if not working on the score, you scored the whole film? You did it in collaboration? How did the scoring process go? Yeah, um, I score all my films. Um, I did it with my best friend, Michelle Carter, who she's a funny story because she's obviously a great musician and we work together great, you know, doing post music. But I have this thing. She's not an actress and she's basically Phoebe from Friends, like this like total like weird hippie girl that's just like bizarre. And so I have this thing about wanting to put her in all my movies and seeing what I can make her do. <laughs> so she is the insect monster at the end of the film. She is the roommate that walks in with like the the wig, this like move to Ruby at, in the in the final sequence. She's mm -hmm. one of the junkie roommates and um she may have, oh, she's in the dance. I try to put her in like anything I can and just see. And she's like into it now. I think she just like wants to be a horror movie actress, which is hilarious. So yes, her and I spend endless hours. Once I get all, once I mix all the dialogue, get all the dialogue in, we spend endless hours doing score and sound and it's it's great. And my band, um, Quinn, we actually performed the, um, the end song in the film. Yes, yeah. yes. I, Which I is figured, called Frank. <laughs> yeah. 
I I had a feeling knowing that you are not only an actor and a director, but also a rock star, that we would be <laughs> hearing your music over the end credits. That was... Well, I really wanted to incorporate Quinn because we're a newer band. It's a girl mm -hmm. band. And then it was also really fun doing the the love scene with Mary Lane. That's um, myself and my friend uh, Tyler Connolly from the band Theory of a Dead Man were singing. And we made wrote that song. And it's almost like a Disney princess love story song that's like this old school Disney. So that was really fun, too. That was like a special song to make. And we kind of made it in the final hour. Um, because we were actually going to use a song from Cinderella, and they we couldn't clear it. So you didn't yeah. you didn't have the money yeah, in the right? budget to clear Cinderella yeah. music. I know, weird, right? So we just we're just like, okay, I want to make this old school, you know, little love song that you would hear in an old Disney movie, and so that's what we did. Um, I think I think we've gotten through all my big questions about okay. Frank. I've got a good half dozen more, but okay. um, we need to we need to talk about where people can find this film if indeed they want to find it. And I suggest that they should want to find it. Where <laughs> where is it going to be, if anywhere? Do you do you have a plan for it? Um, I don't know yet. Uh, we have a distribution deal with Alameda Entertainment. So I've heard of them. They are yeah, an, a fine, weird. upstanding. I mean, they're outfit. okay. Yeah, Ooh. no, they're great. <laughs> Obviously. So yes. So they've been my partner in this, and we are currently just deciding which is the best scenario for Frank and the best, you know, release platform. And, um, you know, we have some favorites and we're just, we should know really soon, but I think our tentative release date is October 25th. So just in time for just Halloween. Just in time for Halloween. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, so you've got some some plans going on for Frank. Are, are are you done with filmmaking? Are you retiring from the game? I mean, one and done. No, no. <laughs> Do you have future? You've got more features up your sleeve. I actually just finished my second feature um, called "I Live Alone," and it stars you, Bonnie. You mean finished directing? Uh, we finished filming it. It's done. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's in the can. Um, and so it stars Bonnie Aarons after working with Bonnie once and then... Did you get a luxurious 10 days of filming for this one or are you still at six? Ooh, we, we did it in five, I think. That's the wrong direction. You're <laughs> yeah. supposed to be having I know. more space to breathe. I know, right? Less prosthetic work or the same amount in this one? Cre it, less monster prosthetic, but more effects. Like, because like I said, we do all, um, all practical. So... We have a guy getting a meat hook in his mouth and out of his eyeball. We have um, a really bizarre scene with a nurse ripping open her own body and another lady feeling around inside of it. You like that, that chest thing. Yeah, it's there's something about it. It's weird. It just feels weird. And then I also get to play a victim. In it. Uh, Bonnie stabs me brutally to death, but we use like some crazy gross like meat and all this stuff in that so it's just it's really gross and we milk it as much as possible so yes and no there was a lot of effect work um my makeup girl ashley is incredible and she just like i'm like can we do this she's like yeah and what about if we also do this and so we just yeah we take advantage does this new one have a whoops i killed you storyline anywhere in it or have you have you moved on from that so the storyline basically Bonnie plays a character, Aunt Len, who's this really weird, reclusive, paranoid woman. And um, her niece has to come stay with her, who's 16, because her mother's sick in the hospital. And so she comes, and then the niece starts getting really freaked out because she starts to realize, like, oh, there's something off with my aunt. There's, like, weird noises coming from the basement. She's, like, up late at night cleaning knives. And she starts to suspect that she's a serial killer. And... This is a film that you're going to think is one thing, and there's a big twist, and it's not. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it, because Frank, honest to God, it kept unfolding in ways that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> so I, I I would expect nothing less from you. The oh, pressure is you. now on. I, oh, God. I hope hope I fulfill your... Uh... <laughs> I, I have no worries. I have no worries at all. I really enjoyed Frank a lot. Thank you. Um, let's let's talk to, to kids who are just getting into the game. Um, yeah. you've, got, you've got a bit of a... You've got a couple miles under your belt as a director. Yeah. Uh, what what do you want those just them's just starting to know before they pick up a camera? You know, I would say the biggest advice I could give anybody, and I think I mentioned this earlier on in the interview, is don't wait around for somebody to offer you an opportunity. Make your own opportunity. Write something. If you can't pull off a feature, write a great short. If you're if you're I want to be a director, get a great cinematogra cinematographer partner. Get 
you know, get find a great actor or two and make it. Just make it. And then it's something physically there that exists that people can see how great you are and you can grow and hopefully get hired for more things based on that. And I just think that a lot of people think they have to wait around or wait for the perfect opportunity to come to them. And it's, you know, that's one in a million or one, a lot, a lot more than one in a million. And I think just make your own opportunities and just, I mean, that's what I did with Frank. We just, you know, we were dealt a really shitty time and I got a group of people together that are beyond talented that happened to be available because COVID made that possible. And we very, very safely and small <laughs> group made this great film that we're all really proud of. And, you know, there's no reason why anybody else couldn't do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's um, you just just do the do the damn thing. Yeah. yeah just do just, it. Just quit talking about it and do it. You know, yep, I said yep, I hate yep. people who just talk, talk, talk. Just fucking do it. You know? Well, I hope to God that I haven't talked, talked, talked too much through oh, this interview. You're exhausting. <laughs> well, um, now in the uh, in the five and five, I think it was in five and five. You mm -hmm. mentioned Texas Chainsaw. Yes. And that was I, I saw that the first time. I think I was maybe 17, 18 years old. I could not sleep that night. There was something <laughs> about that that just ate me alive from inside. What are what are some of the other horror films that really spoke to you and who are some of your who are your guys or gals yeah. who are your directors who are your who are your filmmakers in the horror genre? That's a really hard question. The thing about horror it, which I love and which makes me so connected to it is that the, all the subgenres like there's a little something for everybody or for your mood. I truly watch a horror film every single day, like a different one. I watch it every night before bed. That's my go-to thing, and I know it's weird, but it just does something mentally for me. Um, I love The Strangers. I thought that film, to me, that idea is one of the scariest things. Real life people breaking into your home where you feel like you're safe and you know, brutally <laughs> terrorizing you, um, I think, I, that's Brian Bertino film. Um, I love it. I love obviously classics. I love Wes Craven. I I saw Scream as well when I was like super young, and that kind of connected me to the horror comedy thing. But also, when you go horror comedy, the gore element and the scare element. When I saw Scream that young, I was like, "This is terrifying," <laughs> and now it's just super fun, right? Yep. But, yep. No, that film really, really set the tone for that whole next generation of of horror. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Sam Sam Raimi is another one. Um, I I mean, I could I could go on forever about directors, but I yeah, I think um, you know someone like Toby Hooper is very. I, there's just like the Evil Dead's. Um, God, I've seen some films recently that I really loved. I saw, um, I thought The Dark and the Wicked were great. was great. I thought um, The Lodge. I There's this film called Funny Games. It was actually a remake. Oh, I know um, the one. I know the one. That, the opening yeah. credits are very hard to make it through, but if you get past the opening credits, <laughs> yeah. golly, what a, what, a, what a weird film. And It was fucked. And I just, I remember when I saw that film, I... It was me and what, like two other friends. What's that blonde friends. actor's name? The the main oh, boy. Oh, um, Michael Pitt. Yes. Yeah. He is from another dimension yeah, and warmly terrifying. welcomed in this one. I yes. No. I I seriously like. I hope at some point I get to direct a film with him in it or be in a film with him. And I think. Oh, he's for sure. Amazing. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Have you seen the Dreamers? I haven't. Oh, you're in for a treat. Yeah. Yes. Okay. He's so good in that. One of my favorite film. When just just keep an eye out when he starts to write his mother a letter is one of my favorite moments in all of cinema. I'm not going to say more than that. Okay. Well, I guess I know what I'm watching tonight. Um, <laughs> not yeah. horror. Uh, you might need to watch matter. another film after that one yeah. if if you need a horror to fall asleep. Well, you know, it's I got really used to watching Forensic Files before bed, and then it, and, you know horror films. I used to for a while. I fell asleep to The Shining every single night for months. That was another one that haunted my very mm -hmm. soul. Something about that. Uh, you know, I'm not breaking new ground here saying that The Shining is a well-made film. Well, yeah. I mean, all of his films are amazing, but but that film was really special. And um, yeah, horror has been kind of the thing. Well, I'm also skipping one of my favorite films of all time, which is The Craft, which heavily influenced me. I'm a person who, because of my age, the late 90s, early 2000s horror were, were like the thing that, you Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It would it have was, been right on time for you, the, yeah, the Craft. And I just, when I saw that film, I was 
like these these are the girls I want to be friends with. This is this is these people get me, and you know um, I've really tried to incorporate that feel in some of my filmmaking, just the way those films make me feel. Um, but yeah, I think horror is everything, and I'd love to make films obviously outside of horror, but it's hard when the genre calls me so. <laughs> You know, so closely, and I feel so connected to it. It's just like anytime you're going to make a film, it's just so much fun to make a horror movie. Also, like there's there's the aesthetic pull and the emotional pull, but also horror. There's low upstart costs and a and a very dedicated, enthusiastic fan base. Like it makes yeah. sense in the early days to be working in that genre, just because financially it it, it yeah. works out. Well, it that absolutely, and I think. Um, it's one of those, yeah, it's the following. I've never seen such a diehard fans of anything ever. It's like the horror fans are ultimate. And also just it's a worldwide thing. You know what I mean? You can make a horror film that like could blow up in a country that you're like, you've never even been to. Yes. Whereas it's very hard to make all comedies and maybe translate or all, you know, you make a romantic drama and it's like as much as I love those films – they don't always work everywhere. Whereas yeah. I feel like horror works everywhere. Everybody likes to be scared. Yep, 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 yep. And you get to work in, not broad, but you get to work in, in archetypes in horror. You can have Richie Bitch. Yeah. And we all know, like, Richie Bitch, gonna get, she's going to get hers. Yeah. And it's just fun and to it's watch. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> Set it up, knock it down. It's a good genre for, for that. Totally. Um, which is why it did kind of break my heart to see uh, Mary Lane. I didn't want to see her set up and knocked down. Well, you know, maybe she got exactly what she wanted. That's what you have to ask yourself. Did she? She may have. I hear you. I, yeah. I, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not to trying each to. Each their own, fight. right? Yes. 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 <laughs> um, spiders, maybe at the top of the list. Yes. What else scares you? Like, what actually? You see a, a horror movie at night. Eventually, you might get a little desensitized to to jump scares and and the zing noises. Yeah, jump scares are. You know, whatever. To me, sometimes some they're important, but they they sometimes are like the cheap way to go to scare people. Same with like excessive gore, just for gore. Yeah, it's it, the jump scares are one crayon in a box of what should be ninety six. Yeah, and they're important. They're yeah. you know, but I think yeah, home invasion stuff, real life killers to me are is the scariest thing. Some people can't watch exorcism stuff. Some people can't watch supernatural. You know, definitely that stuff can fuck with me. But I think just knowing that something like that could actually happen to you in real life. And, you know, even a character like Michael Myers is really scary because he he was a real guy. Obviously, he's some sort of evil entity as well, but he's a real person and he just keeps coming back. And I think that idea, and which is why The Strangers messed with me so much, or Funny Games, it was just so brutal what other human beings do to each other. And... You know, definitely one of my next films, I want it to be really about that. I've got a very funny game specific question, and okay. I'm going to ask it as um, to you as a filmmaker. Okay. Do you think that you would, he kind of, um, funny games kind of, kind of does something rare mm -hmm. where the, the main character rewinds a scene so he can do it again. Yeah. Would you ever pull a trick like that? Or do you? Do you feel do you feel like that was kind of a cheap shot that the villains pulled in funny games that Um I think the beauty of making a horror film is that there is no rules. It's kind of when I talked about being in a band and and writing my own songs that I don't have to think about anybody else but myself. I think that when you make a film, you need to make bold choices and I think that there are no rules. You know, it's funny cuz a lot of people who go to film school and they and they They'll follow very specific rules and there aren't any like I think you can I, I, I didn't I liked that choice because I think it may it was a weird moment in the film. It was, I loved it. Know. I loved it because it, it, it confirmed exactly what the film was seeming like it, it said like this is this is what you're watching right now. I feel yeah. like that was a vital moment mm -hmm. that defined funny games as a film for sure. Uh, but I can also understand why audiences might be frustrated and feel like, well, what's the point of watching if the if if none of the rules that I lean on to to understand entertainment, yeah, they may or may not apply anymore. Yeah, well, I mean, I I just don't think there are rules. I think that when people follow rules, they get into traps, and you're like, oh, I know what's going to happen at this point in the story. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then this is going to happen, and then it's going to come back around, and then this, you know, I like films that surprise me, and. 
I try to at least make choices within my films that, you know, there's the moment when Mary Lane just turns and she starts speaking directly at camera. You know, some people be like, that's weird. You shouldn't do that. But I'm like, well, maybe it shifts people's perspective for a moment and all of a sudden you feel like you're Oh, I like that. I thought character. that worked that worked perfectly. That was, yeah. I, I don't mean to keep going back to Mary Lane, but that was yeah. when <laughs> you started unfolding rules and, and reconfiguring the, yeah. the Rubik's Cube that I was looking at. And I really like in films, um, and I'm sure you get to, and it, it sometimes drives my cinematographer crazy, but and we argue about it, but he ultimately ends up telling me I was right. I like... When films, if if it makes sense, long takes. Like oh, staying always, on a scene. Always go for the long take if you can. It I says so like much more. You're just yeah, you're sucked into a moment and it's and it builds this tension and it builds it's just it does something else. It really feels like you're Lindsay back there with the fly on the wall in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And there were some times in Frank where I was going, Oh, she's doing it. Yeah. She's doing it. <laughs> she's still doing it. Yeah. Definitely the second story I did it a lot and Mary Lane's story I did it a lot. Mm -hmm. Um because those particular stories really lent themselves for that choice. But it's something I always appreciate in films. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna check with producer Lindsay mm -hmm. and see if I've missed any key talking points. Okay. Lindsay, have we missed any key talking points? No, I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> okay, would you be good enough to tell us your social medias? Yes. Well, uh, my Instagram is Chrissy Fox, K-R-S-Y-F-O-X. Um, my website chrissyfox.com all spelled the same facebook chrissy fox everything's chrissy fox and you can also check out my production company one fox productions uh your your instagram is a goddamn adorable thank you the, um <laughs> can we talk a little bit about your child i mean yes i would love to talk all right about we're gonna close out with baby talk is okay. that okay yes <laughs> um how, how old is yours she will be two on saturday good lord congratulations you. have you got a big party planned well, because of the weird COVID thing, we're doing it smaller, but her biggest mm -hmm. request was a Peppa Pig cake. So I went crazy and I bought like a $300 Peppa Pig cake. And so that's going to be her big thing. And we're making a water park in our backyard. And she, her best friend, who's her, her bubble buddy, is coming over. And it's going to, and Bonnie, who is also randomly my baby's best friend, is Bonnie the nun. Um, they they love each other so much and it's so bizarre. Like she carries around a nun doll with her everywhere. She puts it in her purse and like we take it to Starbucks and it's it's a thing. So she's very excited that her two best friends, one is three and one is 61, are coming to her birthday party. That's excellent. Yeah. Congratulations. Aren't <laughs> kids you. the best? They're the best. I'm trying to, I, I have a five month old. Oh, congratulations. Uh, love it. Absolutely. Boy love or girl? It. Boy. Oh, what's his name? His name is Darius. Oh. We call him King Darius well, because yes. he rules with an iron fist. <laughs> of course. Um, you just wait till he's a toddler. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, I was walking, walking, walking around. I live in Glendale. Mm -hmm. And um, the old Armenian men were playing uh, Pinochle or whatever it was at yeah. the park. And the one guy looks up and he goes, babies are best. Oh. <laughs> And I agree with him. Babies are best. Congratulations on your Thank wonderful toddler. Thank you. They are the best. It's crazy. Um, people are always like, oh, newborn baby, that must be exhausting. No, no, no. Baby time is easy time. It's toddler time that you have to, yeah, prepare for. And it's like every time you think, oh, okay, this is as, as crazy as it's going to get. It gets crazier. I believe it. Yeah. He has started. <laughs> he can't crawl, but he can pull himself oh, yeah. like a little yeah, horror monster. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's all over. <laughs> um, are you planning on more as one... Well, I have a stepson who's 17. He's he's going into senior year and uh, Which one's easier, the 2-year-old or the 17-year-old? They're equally as difficult for different reasons. It's crazy cuz the 2-year-old, you know, she, her and I are like just doing stuff together all day and it's it's it tends to be easy as long as I'm engaged with her at every moment. She tells me now to put my phone down, so it's kind of like a slap in the face. You're like, "Wow, okay. Cool." But yeah, no, teenagers are a whole other beast that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it, it switches. Sometimes I think, oh, he's so easy. And then sometimes I think that she's definitely easier. <laughs> and I think we're going to have to wrap it up there on Baby Talk because, you know, non-parents, they just like, they don't get it. They yeah, just no, don't get I it. I get it. <laughs> okay. What is it like to be a woman who is also a filmmaker in Los Angeles? Wait, wait, wait. Are you, are, you're not leaving. I'm sorry. I, no, come back. Come on. Come back. Don't leave. Oh. 
Oh, this is horrible. This is the worst thing that's ever happened on an interview I've conducted. Well, okay, guys. Um, oh, Jesus. I, I really screwed that up. I gotta go. This is... 